Welcome to today's presentation of Informix Archiving with OnBar and ISM. Uh, it is just right at the top of the hour, but in case uh, our clock's a little bit fast or I, we have other people uh, uh, just coming in, we'll do a, a quick introduction here. I always find it fascinating to take a look at who's attending and 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 what what locations in the country are represented. We do have uh, attendees today from a couple places in Texas, Plano, uh, McKinney, and uh, Austin. We've also got folks from uh, Raritan, New Jersey, Rochester, New York, and uh, just up the road from us in Castle Rock, Colorado. Uh, we've got guests from Connecticut, uh, Coral Springs, Florida, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We're glad to have all of you. Thanks for, um, thanks for joining us today for this webinar. <laughs> Uh, my name is Ray Cameron. I'm here in Colorado along with Ron Peacock for today's presentation of Introduction to Informix OnBar and ISM or uh, Archiving. Uh, today's presentation is uh, a presentation of Extivia. We have solutions and services covering data uh, management, database management, portal development, application development, business intelligence, and data warehousing. And, a number of other things. You can find out more about us and these services at extivia.com. It's likely that it's likely that you've already been there, uh, considering the fact that you're on the webinar with us today. During our webinar, um, everybody will be on mute. We mean no offense by that, but just because of the number of people, it uh, we, we we're we're keeping the the audio off. However, we will be taking questions. So. Uh, anytime during the webinar, you're welcome to submit those questions, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation. Just in case you're new to GoToWebinar, you'll find the Q&A module in the GoToWebinar control panel. It should be on the right side of your screen. Our presenter today is Ron Peacock. He's the Senior Database Administrator at Extivia. He started working at IBM in 1998, where he served for over 10 years. Since 2003, Ron has been trained as an archiving specialist working with OnBar and ISM, and Ron is an IBM certified system administrator for Informix Dynamic Server, and I know he's put a lot of time and effort into getting ready today. He's probably ready, ready to go. So, Ron, uh, how about uh, uh, we get started? Sure. Uh, thanks for that, Ray. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. And... Um... I congratulate you on at least trying to learn a little bit more on OnBar and ISM. Um, there's a lot of people who get afraid of them because they think it's too difficult. And hopefully after this, you'll find that it's it's not all that difficult. Anyways, I find that uh, before we get into the main story, we need to look a little bit at history. Uh, Informix, uh, in its early days, um, well, in the early days, Informix Archives was Standard Engine and the early Turbo. They used just regular system tools to back up database files, things such as copy and tar and anything else that would make a copy. The big problem with that is the engine had to be offline for those to be effective. Obviously, in the late 80s, early 90s, we didn't have the Internet, and so we didn't have multi-office systems going to the effect that they are now. And um, so that meant that, for the most part, engines were small, backing them up wasn't too big of a problem. But with the advent of the Internet and the ability for now to have a single database server handle multi-offices, taking an engine offline at any point in time started to become a major serious issue. So Informix uh, corrected that problem with the online server when they introduced TB tape. TB tape the biggest feature was the archiving of the system while it's still processing transactions, uh, which was at the time a very novel idea. This was made available because of the physical log, which was a new entry into the database server world. TB tape featured basic tape management. It was very easy to use. The commands were not something that you needed to memorize an entire list a mile long. They were archived at the system level. Uh, which when I say system level, that's not looking at the host. That was looking at just the database server system level. So if you have multiple databases on the server, it took all of those databases. It had support for incremental backups as well as logical log backups. You utilize separate devices for archives and or log backups. 
you had automatic and continuous log backup options. Now, when I say automatic, that means that uh, just on tape A or TV tape A at the time uh, would back up all the logs that needed backing up. Where continuous, of course, the old TV tape minus C, uh, that ran in the background, and the moment a log filled up, it backed it up immediately. Uh, you were able to restore to the system or DB space level, and as of uh, a 10.x, you were also able to restore table level restores. And of course, TB tape was later renamed on tape with the release of seven uh, versions of the online dynamic server. The biggest limitations of the day, two gig file size limit, which was introduced because of the OSs. It was not designed for scripting and still yet today is not overly friendly to it. Um, and as the data grew larger, performance started to become an issue. It didn't seem like too much of a problem when you had a gig of true data, but now that people are starting to talk terabytes, the performance that TV tape takes uh, become a big hit. So as of version 7, Informix started to look towards other solutions. How can we improve performance? Well, one area to improve performance would be to parallelize, and that's where we started to see on archive. Now on archive, uh, it featured the parallel archive and restores. Uh, you had multiple tape drive support, so you could actually write your archive out to multiple tape drives at, all at the same time. Uh, it had a more advanced tape management features with some overwrite protections and recycling, um, and as well as operational features that on tape didn't show, such as unattended operations, where it's designed to be scripted and probably run from cron in the middle of the night. Uh, and also had some security facilities that were not available on tape as well. But on archive was not without limitations. It was not easy to use. This was not written by Informix, which means it didn't follow the on tape model. It was written by a third party, it was purchased, and I'll be honest, when I was working in support, nobody liked on archive. Um, there was probably two customers ever I've ever seen using it. And it really came down to, it took a large number of commands just to set up and run a single archive. And you didn't want to have to memorize a command line that was 100 characters long, just so you could go into another command line uh, that was almost as big to execute the job you set up on the first command line. So a lot of people did not really like it. And by the time uh, 7.2 came around, Informix was looking to go in a different direction. And that's where they started to look at a new feature called OnBar. OnBar was first introduced in the online dynamic server 7.21. Uh, because it was also written by Informix, they used OnTape as a model, and it was easy to use with a similar command structure as OnTape. It featured parallel backup and restores, and a new feature, the restartable restores. In the past with on tape, if your restore failed on DB space 99 of 100, you had to restart your restore all over again at DB space 1. And that obviously, if that was a 10 hour restore, you're starting your 10 hour restore all over again. With a restartable restore, you might be an hour nine and a half, and if it fails, you may only have to step back one or two DB spaces uh, and just restore from there. The DB spaces that completed, we're allowed to stay completed, so we didn't basically we didn't redo the work that we did before. Now, like on tape, it could archive at a system or DB space level, but on or, sorry, like on tape, it could restore to a system or DB space level, but on bar could also archive at a DB space level as well. And of course, as of version 10, you could also table level restore as well. It also featured unattended backups uh, with the designation that the expectation, there's nobody at the keyboard. It does not prompt the user for any information when you run the command, which made life a lot easier for database administrators. And as far as um, device support, um, OnBar doesn't actually support any devices because it backs up to an XOpen Backup Services Application Programming Interface. And thank God that can be shortened down to XBSA. Um, any XBSA compliant storage manager, OnBar can work with and transfer all of its data to however that storage manager has been instructed to store the data. 
This added new device support because any device supported by that storage manager, OnBar now supports. Uh, whether that be optical devices, intelligent tape drives, jukebox devices, or any other type of device that you can imagine that a storage manager could make use of. Now, OnBar did have its limitations in the 7.2 series. It, the limitation was one of its biggest features. It required an XBSA compliant storage manager. And not every customer had one. Smaller customers couldn't afford one. They didn't need a monstrous storage manager system uh, to back up their entire network. So this meant that a lot of persons could not utilize OnBar. And there was a lot of set up with a storage manager that could be difficult because most people didn't have instructions on what do I need to do to set this up. So as Informix mulled that over, they come up with a solution and they got together with Legato Business Systems and Informix Storage Manager was born. As of release 7.30, Informix Storage Manager has shipped with every release since then. It was written by Legato, and so a lot of its command sets and binaries uh, will look identical to Legato and function identical to Legato. Um, but unlike the Legato networker, there was limits placed on many features, including some of those tape libraries that the more advanced storage managers can support you're going to find ISM does not support those. <clears throat> now there are only three versions of ISM to date and two of those three versions have been obsolete for a couple of years. Version 1 and version 2 were only released with the version 7.3 of IDS. So most customers today you should not see version 1 and version 2. There were a lot of problems, uh, a few features that um, actually got in the way and um, they relented and had to release a third version which is still the current version today which is 2.20. Um, as I said 11.7 still ships with 2.20. The only difference between the 2.20 of 731 is that a lot of people were using it 32-bit then where it's 64-bit today. Um, some of the main points that you really need to be aware of is it does not coexist well with Legato Networker Client or Server. In fact, the Legato instructions will tell you to go rename a lot of the Informix commands um, in the Informix or bin directory that relate to an ISM just because they will interfere with their server. Um, Informix did give an updated command list to kind of fit with the Informix standards. Uh, you'll see what we mean when we get to those a little bit later. Uh, they did limit it to four configured devices where Legato can have, um, I'm not even sure if there is a limit, I've seen as many as 32 simultaneously configured devices. Uh, it's capable of backing up multiple instances of, of the Informix dynamic server to a single Informix storage manager instance. Unlike IDS where you can have up to 255 theoretical instances on a machine, you only can have one Informix storage manager instance, so all instances have to be backed up through one Informix storage manager. And back in the original days of 7.3, there was a GUI interface available through the Informix Enterprise Command Center, uh, and later after IECC was discontinued with the DBA toolkit. Um, the one big note, though, is it does not, even still today, does not support clustered installations. It pretty much locks itself down to the node with the host name. So when you change nodes, it doesn't like to move very well. Now, setting up ISM, there's a few things we need to remember. The default administrative user is the system administrator, not the Informix user. You have to remember, this has got its backbone with Legato, and that means we need to have some root access to do certain features. Now we can add other administrative users, users who can then add tapes and label volumes and change tapes and things like that, but the biggest key thing we have to remember is the system administrator is still the only user that can start or stop the Informix storage manager. It is a totally separate entity from the Informix dynamic server. The only connection between it is the onbar command. So don't start thinking that, oh, ISM is so locked into IDS. There's, the only thing that they share is the, the installation directory and the on-bar connectivity. 
and also mentally or logically, treat all disk devices as if the directory itself is a tape. ISM internally will treat them as a tape. The only difference is, is you're going to be able to actually look in the directory and see the actual save set files themselves. Um, and then always, unlike on tape, always use non-rewind tape devices. ISM is a storage manager. He can put multiple save sets onto a single tape or disk device. And that means with a tape, he can actually issue a fast forward or rewind to search through the save sets to look for the one particular one he's looking for. Now, utilizing on, uh, on bar and ISM, we have some new terminology that we have to look at. Uh, a volume is a single tape. It's no different than, you know, physically a tape. You, how many do you have? Do you have 10, 50, 100? Well, a volume is just a single tape. Uh, a pool is a logical grouping of volumes, and we'll see this a little bit more when we start covering or looking at the actual setup itself. The device is the physical tape drive, or in the case of a file system, the directory where you're going to allow ISM to read and write from. And of course, the big new term is a save set, which in the storage manager world is any object that the storage manager is requested to save. Now, this could be made up of file system files, uh, whether they be you know, standard WAV files or, or JPEGs or, or any other type of file you can imagine. But there are also the level 0, level 1, and or level 2 backups, as well as each individual logical log becomes its own safe set as well. Now, we also have a few other things to note. Volume names have no rules unless you make them. Now, I personally recommend that you give yourself something in the name that gives you an idea of somewhere in the linear scheme of your tapes where it belongs. You don't have to. I mean, you can name them just like you name your pets. Um, but when it comes time that you have to start, oh, w which piece of media did I put this on, it's going to make it harder to locate the exact tape that you want. Um, pool names. There are six built-in Informix Storage Manager pools, and you can see them listed here. Um, now, two of them are designated for cloning purposes, which I'm not going to get into today. That's more of an advanced course. And to be honest, I think I've never seen a single person who's actually doing cloning outside of just testing it. Uh, but it is a nice feature to have, and if you want to look into it, feel free to do so. Um, now, the other pools, again, they're kind of like volume names in that they don't really have rules. Uh, a lot of customers see that word disk in those latter two and believe that if they're going to a file system, they have to use the ISM disk data or ISM disk logs, which can't be further from the truth. Those particular pool names were just ones that they, uh, they knew, knew they needed with four devices. They wanted at least four pools, and for whatever reason, they chose these names. Personally, I back up all my data to ISM data, whether I'm on disk or tape, um, and there's no problem there. You can actually back up your logs to ISM data. Again, there's no rules as to which one you use. Uh, the only rule of thumb that there usually is is don't start trying to mix disk-type devices and tape devices into a single pool. Uh, try to keep those in separate pools, which is why they're all another reason why they're separate uh, names there for you to use. Here are the supported devices that uh, ISM supports. And uh, I'm sure one thing that if you're up on tape devices, you'll note that a lot of these devices seem to be kind of old. And they are. You have to remember that even the latest and greatest version of Informix Storage Manager is 2.20, and that was shipping back somewhere in... Uh, 1997, I think, is when uh, 7.3.1 started shipping. So there's been a lot of new tape devices that have been released since this list was compiled. Now, the good news is, is with your AITs or LTO tape drives, pretty much if you choose a DLT type and point it at those drives, you're going to have pretty good success. I don't think I've heard of anyone failing with that. Now, the one caveat with that is, 
don't try to utilize a USB type device. If you're on Windows and the tape device plugs in via USB port, you're going to find that in most cases, the, when they use USB, you're not going to be able to use them with ISM or on tape for that matter, or even Windows backup. You actually have to have specialized software designed to go through that USB port. So you're probably not going to see ISM work within a USB type drive. Um, Linux, they're I guess there's a potential you might be able to utilize them, uh, but as of uh, my last experience with them, they don't work very well. So if it plugs in via the USB port, you're probably not going to have much success. Now in Formic Storage Manager, as I said, we did write some commands that uh, made it easier for the users to utilize rather than trying to memorize a whole series of commands that started with the word NSR you have a bunch of commands here that start with ISM. Now these commands all each have their own feature and you can see what they do. We will go over them in depth here very shortly. Um, the only uh, couple ones that you need to make note of is ISM startup and shutdown again can only be executed by the system administrative user on Unix. When you're dealing with Windows it's slightly different because there's three services that you have to start up. And those three services, of course, have hard-coded in the service installation to start as the administrator, uh, which does make it a little easier because if the user has the ability to start and stop services, you don't necessarily need the administrator. Um, and then ISM Watch, um, that is only available on Unix or Linux, so that's not something on Windows. Uh, we'll take a look at that in a moment, but it is a nice utility uh, that you can monitor the current activity on ISM. And now that we've gone over the basics, I guess we now need to get to see how do we set this up. Now there's a large bit of Informix, OnBar, and ISM already set up and pre-configured for you, uh, but uh, you still have some other things to set up. First, we need to get ISM started. And you can see there, just like on init, ISM startup has a dash init command. Now, unlike his on init Informix sibling, if you run ISM startup dash init a second time, he's not going to wipe out what the first one did. Uh, obviously, I'm sure any one of you who played with Informix for any length of time know you run on init IY, you're going to wipe out your server, whatever you have already configured. That's not the case here. If the dash init happens to see that the files already exist, he doesn't try to overwrite it. If they don't exist, it then recreates them. So. Uh, that's always good to know. Now you can see here from my uh, screenshot that uh, when I initialized there was looks like an error message complaining about the environment variable printer is not set. This is extremely common and to be honest I'm not really sure why the error pops up other than it does try to print um, the bootstrap information. To be honest, unlike its legato big brother, the bootstrap information is not as critical with Informix Storage Manager. Uh, when you're dealing with 32 or 100 devices, you kind of would like to have the configuration handy. With ISM, you only have four devices, and uh, it's really not something that's to the highest importance. And the ability to print it, well, you know, what's it going to do with me on hard copy? I'd rather have something that's saved and backed up. And ISM by default does back up its bootstrap on a periodic basis. So after we get it started up, the first thing we'd probably like to do is add another administrative user. Most customers, they're going to want to be able to administer ISM as the Informix user. In some cases, they may have an operator whose total job is at night, I need to change tapes or I need to you know, put new tapes in the drive. So you may want to add them as well. But you can see here the command is very simply. I mean, we can look at ism dash sorry ism underscore show dash admin, and it shows and displays whatever admin users that you currently have configured. And by default, you can see here root at deathstar deathstar being the system I took these screenshots from. You can clearly see that there's only the root user by default. By using ism underscore add dash admin we can add and you can see there Informix at Death Star is added and when we later show it you can see them listed there. Now one of the questions I get a lot is why do we see the at Death Star? Why do we need that? 
one of the things that ISM is capable of doing is from this instance of ISM, I can administer other servers of ISM. So just because uh, you see Informix at Death Star here, um, I made mention of the GUI tool. Well, maybe I'm going to run it from the GUI tool where I'm not Informix at Death Star. I'm Ron Peacock at whatever my Windows machine happens to be named. So you can do that as well. Plus, any of these ISM commands do have a flag. I think it's dash server. And so you can actually use the ISM command on server A to administer ISM on server B as well. Um, some people utilize that, some people do not, but that's why there's the at symbol before the host name there. Now, once we get the administrative users in place, the rest of the setup you can do as either root or, in this case, Informix. So the next thing we need to do is we need to start looking at devices. And by default on every installation, I don't care if it's Windows, Linux, Solaris, AIX, there's always an 8mm 5 gig device configured. The only thing that changes is the actual path. And you can see here um, on this version of Linux, there's an 8 millimeter 5 gig device on slash dev slash NSRT8. Now, most people I've ever dealt with, I don't know of anybody who's really used an 8 millimeter 5 gig device other than myself. In the Informix lab, we did have a couple of those lying around. Um, but um, it, they're not something that I see in a lot of use today. Most people are probably going to be using something a little more robust like an LTO or even LTO2, AIT, DLTs, uh, because those get much better performance than the old 8 millimeters did. So one of the first things we're going to have to do is we're going to have to remove that tape drive. And the removal command is simply ism underscore rm dash device and the path to the device. And you can see here where I issue that command. It removes that device, and when I show it, now there's no devices configured. Uh, so now we have that removed, and we're ready to build our copy of ISM with our devices we want to use. Now one of the things I've gone and done is I've created a few disk directories so that we can utilize those for backing up with ISM. Now tape drives are not that hard to do. Just like here, you can just set it to the path to the tape drive. Um, I don't have a tape drive on Linux, so we're going to have to use some disk directories. And you can see here, I added four different devices, and they're all four are directories. And remember, they're not files like Informix chunks. Um, even Tivoli, by the way, uses its disk, dev the, yeah, disk devices, much like Informix uses chunks. With Informix Storage Manager, it utilizes an actual directory. So the command to do so is simply ism underscore add dash device and then the path to our directory and then we just have to tell it that the type is file. And obviously anything in the dash type field just refer back to that previous chart that we saw. You can see I also do a list of the devices and you can see now that all four devices are listed but we have nothing mounted on the file disk slash backup slash dev and then whichever number. Now again, don't look at the word file and get all panicky that this is going to be a file. Again, it is a directory. Okay, so now we have to start dealing with media. Now I did make a comment to the fact of treat everything within the file device as if it was a tape. Just because it's a directory that doesn't mean that you can't change out tapes from time to time because file systems do fill up. We need to change them out. Maybe we're going to back up that directory using uh, some other backup solution, whether that's just copying it to a different system or what. So we need to actually label the contents of that directory. Now to label that, that's now adding another command. That is the ism underscore op, which is a course short for operations. In this case we're using ism op dash label the path to our device dash volume and here is where we name our tape and we're gonna put it in whichever pool we choose and you can see here I named this particular volume tape 001 and I put it in the ism data pool. 
again, as I said, I can't harp on it enough, and most customers who start playing with it afterwards thank me later. Treat the contents of that directory, dev1, those contents treat as one block that's one tape. So if you do need to change tapes later, you unmount the tape and then literally take the dev1 directory and move it somewhere else and recreate a new one uh, so you can relabel it. Um, just makes your life easier later. Now from there, um, obviously, we're going to start taking a look at the other ones and we're going to label the rest of those tapes. But note, after we label the rest of the tapes, we don't show anything different in the Dash devices. There's still nothing mounted on those devices. So that means we have to mount it, which basically tells ISM, hey, you can use this now. That's another ISM op command. In this case, ISM op dash mount. And you can see here where I uh, mount the dev1 device. Not very hard. Again, you're pointing at the device itself. Um, you're not telling it to mount a specific volume because if that volume is, does not happen to be in dev1, it's going to kind of throw an error message. So you, you're going to actually mount a device. Now, when it does come to requesting volumes, there are times ISM will ask you to mount a certain volume. Uh, usually that's going to be during a restore. Uh, but um, for the most part, when you're just, in, like in this case, setting up, you just tell it to mount the device, and he's going to look at and read the volume label in that device and then mount that one. And you can see here where I mount the rest of them. And now when you see the dash devices, well, sorry, I guess I didn't mount the rest of them here. Um, when you see the devices, you can see that I do have something mounted on dev1, but there's still nothing mounted on the rest. So when I do do the rest of them, now you can see that they're all ready to go. There's something mounted, and it's right enabled. <clears throat> Once we get to that point, the uh, devices are all ready to go. And one thing I should mention that um, I, I kind of glossed over, uh, when I labeled dev4, um, I called it a log backup and set it to the ISM log pool. Now that will come into handy here shortly once we get to actually taking a backup. Which, for the most part, we're only one step away from actually taking that backup. We have ISM ready to go. We have devices mounted and ready to go on the pools that are the defaults, which we'll talk about in a moment. So we only need to do one more step. We need to tell OnBar what storage manager we're using. That is done through the SM versions file. And you can see here where I renamed the built-in smversions.stv to smversions. This file functions much the same way as an Informix SQL host file does. Now, if you're using a third-party storage manager, such as Tivoli or the actual Legato Networker or Veritas or any other ones that are out there, and there are four or five others off the tip of my tongue, they're going to tell you to add a line to this file, and, and they'll usually give you the line to add. But for the, uh, if you're using Informix Storage Manager, Informix already has that file set up. You just need to rename it, and you're ready to go. And you can see here where I issue the onbar-b, that's the backup command. No, notice that unlike on tape, there's no prompting me for any questions. Uh, do you want to do this, that? Nope. just runs the backup. When we return to the command prompt, you can see there where I also show the status of the volumes and note the ISM show the volumes as plural here. It shows a listing of all volumes that are in as part of the ISM. And you can see where two of those volumes actually have data written to it. So, moving on. We also have another option in that we can issue the ISM show dash volume singular and now we name the volume we want it to show and you can see here where in tape 001 we now have two save sets listed you can see the save set ID and you can see it kind of looks like a convoluted path um, now this varies depending on the version of onbar what the path will look like but these paths are pretty standard whether you're using Tivoli or you're using Legato or Veritas or ISM you're going to see paths that are very similar. 
Um, in this case, it shows in Formix colon, and then the name of the server, in this case, which is Jar Jar, and then the DB space that's backed up. Again, it changes from varying versions of OnBar. If you go back to 731, you'll actually see the DB space names listed there individually. For some reason, 11.x just shows all the DB spaces as root DBS. Now, if you were to go back to the ISM, uh, or sorry, the uh, OnBar IX bar file, you will see these save sets with their actual DB space names attached to them. Again, I'm not sure why OnBar does that in the later versions, but it doesn't cause any problems. Uh, just for the simple fact that, as you can see, they are individual save sets. You can also see the number of bytes that it's written and what date those items were written to, the, the actual volume. And you can see I do the same thing with the log pool. And here there's a little difference where up above you can see where we had root DBS and then the number zero, which, by the way, is the level of that backup. Here, when you start looking at logs, you can see the server num, which is 67, and then the actual log unique ID. So this was log number 462. And then if you go look in the directories, in this case dev1 and dev4, you can actually see files that correspond with the save set IDs. And they're pretty corresponding with the file sizes. Now the file sizes aren't exact because, of course, uh, ISM is recording in the uh, volume listing. The actual size that was handed to it and that size is a little bit different than what is actually stored on disk uh, due to uh, rounding inaccuracies and such. So Now you'll also see when I uh, do the listing of the directory, you can see two other files, .nsr and volume. Those two files make up the volume label. And those two files are why I tell customers, take a look at that entire directory, in this case dev1, and treat that entire directory as one single unit, much like if it was a tape. I've seen customers try to copy these files out, and they always seem to miss .nsr. If you lose that file, it becomes a big problem because ISM will no longer mount that volume. So you want to take it as one big block, whether you tar the directory or you rename the directory and create a new one to take its place. Um, still, either way, uh, it just goes to show why you want to you know, be very careful. Now, there are a few on config parameters that do affect on bar. Um, and, and you can see here the ISM data pool is the pool you want your physical data to go to. Now, physical being level 0, level 1, level 2 backups. The ISM log pool is the pool you want your logs to go to. Now, these obviously by default um, are ISM data and ISM logs. But you don't have to have them different. You can set them to all go to ISM data if you want. Unlike on tape, where writing everything to one piece of media was uh, physically a problem, um, it actually overwrote and, and, and damaged it. Here you can put them all to the same tape, and they will interleave and not give you any problems. Now the L tape dev is really not utilized directly, but if it's set to the null device, log backups are forbidden. I don't care what tool you're trying to use; they'll back up logs. If it's set to the null device on bar, on tape, and on archive are all going to fail if you try to back up logs. So uh, with LTape Dev, if you're using on bar and any storage manager for that matter, um, just make sure it's anything but dev null, and on bar will work perfectly fine. Now there's the bar activity log, which is basically like the uh, message file, uh, which in this case, though, is very specific to on bar itself. Uh, it's the on bar activity log. Again, because OnBar is expected to be an unattended backup, we need some way to record messages uh, so that if you have a problem at 2 in the morning and you need to look at it at 8 the next day, you can turn around and go look here to see, oh, what kind of errors did it get? Did it succeed? Did it fail? And, and uh, kind of give me a rough idea of how it failed. Now, sometimes that's not always enough, so we have a bar debug option where if it's set to zero, it's disabled, and if it's set to a, another number beyond that, it will go into some in-depth debugging of OnBar, and we'll see a little bit more of that in a couple slides. Um, and then there's the bar max backup, and that just sets up the number of OnBar threads that we can have running at a time. Uh, again, that's starting to set up our parallelism. If we're using that 32-device 
legato, we're probably going to want this set to 32. If it's set to zero, it's unlimited. So you can get one thread um, for every DB space minus the root, because the root is always done on a single threaded basis. So if you've got 100 DB spaces, you're going to get 99 simultaneous threads started up to try to back up your server. Um, a thing to think about with that is each one of those threads is going to take some system resources. So you might want to lower this number just to uh, not run out of memory at the OS level. Now I've made mention of ISM Watch a few times, and he is a nice utility, and you can see it here where it shows the status of our ISM server. Now unlike the rest of the commands where they take a snapshot and exit, this here is constantly updating itself. So you can actually keep this up on one screen and see, and like in this case here you can see under devices, it is actively writing to tape 001 when I took the snapshot. So you can see that it's actually ready, and this will change. Uh, the last operations on Dev2 and Dev3 were when I mounted the particular uh, directory. And then, of course, Dev4 um, had done some writing, and it was completed at the point in time that I took the snapshot. The next session or section is looking at the sessions that are connected to ISM at this time. Uh, in this case, you can see that there's some root DB space sections. And if you remember right, there was two save sets that got backed up with this. Those two save sets, um, one of them here has completed, and the other one is still actively going, which is, of course, what it's writing. You'll see messages. The messages section is nothing more than the daemon log, uh, but only the last five lines of it. Uh, so you can see exactly you know, what's getting written to that daemon log in real time. Now we'll cover the daemon log here in a couple slides as well because it is a, a good troubleshooting area to look. And the pending area is simply threads or sessions that are queued up because either devices are busy or there's just not enough of them at this time. Um, as you can see here, I don't have any pending sessions uh, because the system that I used for this only had two DB spaces and they're done single threaded because the root has to be done single threaded. Now another nice feature that I also like to point out even in a basic class is ISM can do some compression on its own. How to do it? It's simply setting an environment variable. ISM underscore compression, set it to true. And you can see here I run another backup and you can see where now our volumes have had more data written to them. But when I go list the individual volume information, you can now see how much the data actually compressed. And in most cases, in my experience, it is somewhere in the neighborhood of four to one, which is pretty good by anybody's measurement. In most cases, people feel pretty good if they can get a two to one. Uh, but compressing at an ISM level seems to go at four to one. And um, I haven't seen too many people veer two or three points away from that whether it's be 3.8 or 4.2, it's usually right in the neighborhood of 4.1. But you can see here where the definite size of the save set on disk and, and how much difference that size is, uh, that can be quite advantageous to a lot of people who are on file size restrictions. Um, and I know we have a customer that ran into that problem not too long ago, and this made a humongous difference for them, able to uh, take their whole backup um, at once rather than uh, almost running out of space every day. So definitely a nice feature, very simple, and it's something I do like to cover in the basic course. Now one of the bigger advantages that I find with OnBar is troubleshooting. On tape, if you failed, it gives you some kind of message to the effect of, hey, I failed, here's a simple code. That code didn't always tell you what it was. Well, when it comes to OnBar, we have more than just a code. Uh, first of all, the first line of defense is the bar activity log. And, and of course, that logs all backup attempts and their success or failure. And sometimes just that alone is enough to tell you what happened. In some cases, it's not. So the next level of troubleshooting is we can set bar debug. And please note that the bar activity log is already a bar debug set to a level of three. So you know, setting it to, to one or two is probably not going to be much help, more help than the bar activity log already is. 
setting it to a level nine literally could be bigger than the actual files that you're trying to back up or restore. All page headers are put in the archive, and when you consider that all pages are put in the actual archive, putting all page headers in the, the debug file is going to get large quite quickly. So usually five or seven are the best values. Um, and I can tell you from working in support, five is usually the first setting I go to, and if it's not enough, I can change it to seven and do it again. Um, now these two um, work whether we're, no matter what storage manager we're using. When we start using ISM or Legato, we can then use the NSR app logs xbsa.messages file, which is the communication layer or the xbsa library communication that gets logged so we can see if there was some kind of communications failure. With ISM, it's not that much of a big deal because the IDS and the ISM are on the same system. Uh, with Legato, this can be a bigger help because now we're going through the network and there may have been some kind of network interference going on. And then as far as the ISM server itself, you have the daemon log, and you can see the path there for it. That's the actual server log for ISM, and that's the actual area for messages that ISM Watch is drawn from. So if you do need to do some debugging, we have different layers that are logged. In, in some cases, the daemon log and var debug uh, can literally get down to the function level and, and kind of help you troubleshoot any problems on var has which makes it easier to fix. Where on tape, you know, first of all, if you scripted it, if you didn't save what the screen output was, you don't have anything. And even if you do, you're going to get a cryptic error message that may not tell you exactly what the problem is. Here, if I don't find a problem right away, I can set a debug and it's going to give me the problem. It's going to tell me where the problem is. Now a note with bar debug, you don't want to leave it set all the time because that does cause a file to get created and grow bigger. But at the same time, it does cause performance drawbacks with OnBar. So you don't always want to leave it set unless you're actually trying to debug a problem. And that's pretty much it for the basic OnBar and ISM setup. So if you have any questions. Ron, thank you. Um, you're like a well-trained athlete. You make this look easy. Thanks. Uh, we did have we, had, we did have one question come in um, during the um, during your presentation, and it was as if uh, they knew right where you were going. It was answered a couple slides later. So it's a qu <laughs> question about compression. Um, and I'll stall here for a minute. And let everybody know that you are welcome to post some more questions. Use your uh, Q and A on the right side of your screen. That would be in the go to webinar control panel and uh, we'll, we'll just try and um, take a take a few seconds here to let you get those typed in if there are any uh, if there aren't we'll uh, we'll wrap up here in just a minute and let everybody uh, get on with their day um, maybe Ron while we're waiting for others to um, to uh, submit questions now you obviously put the put the webinar together and did it with uh, what people would be wanting to know in mind anyway but are there any Questions that you may be able to predict that might that people might have and and address any of those. Well, one of the advantages is working in tech support for all the years that I did is that I did see a lot of the same questions over and over again, and I did try to put them in here. So it's really hard to say that I have other uh, um, other questions. So you know, pretty much I tried to. Uh, um, answer all questions before they can be asked. Now that's not to say that's even possible, but <laughs> well it looks like looks like you may have done that. We we did just have a question come in not specifically about the the content of the the presentation, but uh, the a question about the, the purpose of the webinar and who Extivia is. Yes, this is definitely a way for us to connect with our audience and uh, and let people know what we do, kind of put our put our expertise on display as I think Ron did really well. And uh, as I mentioned in the intro to the call, Extivia is, a, is an IT service company. We, uh, we do portal development, database administration. We've got a variety of services that, uh, um, that, that we can use to meet your needs. And we'll, uh, we'll have a phone number up here on the screen. Um, uh, easiest way to get a hold of us uh, since we're all digital, info at Extivia.com. If there's uh, 
uh, just questions about the, the webinar itself that maybe don't get answered during the call, or if you do need support with a project that you have going on or specific needs with your company, we'd be glad to visit with you about that. Uh, well, um, I don't have the phone number in the slides. I'm sorry for that. That's my okay. mistake. But um, there are three main ways to get in contact with us. Uh, Ray has given you the email address, which is info at xtivia.com. Um, you also can go out to our website at www.xtivia.com, and there is a contact um, tab there, which will give you the phone number as well as that email address again. And the phone number, if you would like it, is 888-685-3101. So, um, but as I said, if you just remember the xtivia.com address, um, all information on how to contact us is also out there at any time. So if you just happen to not write it down, uh, you can go get it out there as well. Great. Good job, Ron. And I think I think you did accomplish your goal. I, I'm not seeing any questions come in. I think we've given people plenty of time to submit those. So, um, uh, Stephen, thank you for your questions, uh, your interaction with us. Uh, we got a couple of comments. Uh, Joe and Jim, thank you for those. We appreciate that. And uh, we're... Uh, Glad to be able to offer this to you today. We do uh, monthly webinars on a variety of topics. You can you can see the upcoming ones uh, posted within the month before them on the website at xtivia.com. And uh, I think that concludes our presentation of um, from today. Give you an extra 10 minutes that maybe you didn't realize you were going to have today. And uh, we look forward to um, hearing from you to see how we can partner up and, and help you out. Thank you.